for something that I didn't do. And he said, you must be harder here. I told you I don't care whether you did it or not, but I'm going to make sure that you is convicted of it. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown in over 30 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org, our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. Today, why the UN airdrops to only one Syrian city, a New Haven rally in support of Standing Rock, and a remarkable program deep in the heart of Alabama. I've mentioned before with some sense of outrage that the United Nations airdrops food in Syria but to only one city and that one under Assad control. We looked into this further. I did an interview with a spokesperson for the World Food Program, Gerald Bork, and for the Syria campaign, Kathleen Fallon. I wrote an article about the matter with my results on peacenews.org. I'll summarize my findings as I show you some World Food Program video of the first airdrop to Deir Ezzor, the Syrian city. Since April, there's been over 150 airdrops to Deir Ezzor, the city of 100,000. It's controlled by Assad forces. Though Assad and Russia, of course, have airplanes, it is the UN that flies in aid. I asked why Aleppo or other Syrian cities don't get airdrops and was told these areas did not have the large and safe drop zones where the one-ton pallets could safely land. I find it extremely hard to understand that no other besieged area in all of Syria has any place for airdrops. Last spring, a promise was made by the United States and Russia that if the sieges did not end, airdrops would start on June 1st. Nothing came of that promise. It's evident that even though the UN Security Council demanded that it be allowed free access for humanitarian work in Syria, Assad forces just refuse, and the UN and the US simply give in, and Syrians starve. The Syria campaign says that many in East Aleppo have only 12 to 15 days of food left. Yesterday it was reported that a 10-year-old in Aleppo starved to death. Read my whole article on peacenews.org. The climate struggle of the year is taking place in Standing Rock. There was an action in New Haven, Connecticut this week. We'll have a full report next week. But right now I wanted to show you scores of people blocking a main street in New Haven in front of the TD Bank. They picked this bank because it's one of the investors in the pipeline up at Standing Rock. Activists are asking that you take money out of the banks that support this pipeline. Now we focus on the Equal Justice Initiative, an amazing institution in Montgomery, Alabama, that I visited as part of the Wheels of Justice anti-racism tour. 
The EJI started as a group of lawyers working with death row prisoners. There's nearly 200 people on death row in Alabama. The EJI was started by attorney Brian Stevenson. We are a nonprofit uh, law office that was founded in 1989, and we represent people on death row here in Alabama, children sentenced to die in prison, to life without parole. Uh, we represent people who have been abused and mistreated in the prison system. Uh, and as we'll talk a good, about, a good bit about, uh, we do a lot of work now on issues of race and poverty, uh, which is a project we started about five years ago. Um, but before we get too into all of that, we wanted to just introduce ourselves to you, uh, and hopefully as the day goes on, we'll get to know you all a little better. I'm, I'm Ben Schaefer. I'm a staff attorney here at the Equal Justice Initiative. I've been here for five years now. I grew up in, in Hamden, Connecticut, so uh, yeah, not, too far, uh, not too far from y'all. Uh, and. I was a sixth grade teacher coming out of college, taught in rural North Carolina, with Teach for America for a couple of years, uh, and really saw, had some amazing kids and saw how little chance they had. Uh, a lot of them, even before I had left teaching, were getting wrapped up in the juvenile system and the adult criminal system. Uh, and so it really opened my eyes. It was an, an experience I wasn't really exposed to growing up in Hamden. And so I ended up working in education policy for a little while, uh, went back to law school, and was lucky enough to take a class with Brian Stevenson, our executive director here, uh, and take a clinic with him where I came down to Montgomery, Alabama, and represented a client, my first client, on Alabama's death row. Uh, and just that work and listening to Brian talk about his work with kids sentenced to die in prison, uh, I, I couldn't turn down the opportunity to come down and, and, uh, and have been here ever since. Cool. I'm Teron Ferguson. Uh, I'm a legal fellow here at the EJI, so I've been here a little over a year now. And listening to Ben talk, I realized, with the exception of our names and like him having the good looks, we actually have the same trajectory. <laughs> 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 Teach for America as well. I taught at elementary school, uh, special education. I went to NYU as well. Uh, I was on the trajectory to do corporate law and um, the Trayvon Martin uh, uh, response uh, came out when I was, I think, uh, I between my, my 1L and my 2L year when George Zimmerman was acquitted. And I was never forget, I was in the middle of Times Square on my lunch break and I was working on uh, an IPO for uh, a company out of the day. Okay. And I was just kind of intellectually checked out from work. And I was like thinking about what was happening in the country and then contrasting that with what I like, wrote my personal statement for law school about. And I was like, this is not why I came here. Mm -hmm. So I went home that day, kind of serendipitously we were registered for classes. And I took every class that I could take on like common law, civil rights, race. <laughs> Two of them were Brian Stevenson's courses. And oh, that became wow. the trajectory. Same as me, took the courses, took the clinic, we could travel to and from New York and here. Um, and after the clinic, after I represented a person uh, that was on death row, um, I was like, I have to come do this right. And I've been here learning and practicing since. So we want to talk to you a little about each of the project areas if we have time. But we were hoping to start uh, with our work on the death penalty. Uh, we began as an organization. I say we, I was not here. I was young. But uh, when Brian came down to Alabama from Atlanta, uh, he came because people were being sentenced to death. And there was no real representation, no real attorneys challenging those death sentences uh, and doing anything. So it was a very quick period of time between being sentenced to death and being executed here in Alabama. So I want to talk just a little about what the death penalty looked like in Alabama when Brian came down and what it looks like now. And hopefully that will just give you a little context for what you're about to see this, this video about one of our clients who was on the row here in Alabama. So when Brian came down, 
there was no public defender system in Alabama for trial attorneys. Who, the person who was appointed to represent you if you were charged with a capital crime was whoever that judge decided he was going to appoint. Uh, and so there were some minimal requirements for experience uh, in the capital context, but there were lawyers falling asleep during the trial, drunk during the trial, many, many lawyers who would call no witnesses uh, when the jury had to decide between life and death, would not call a single witness at that stage. Uh, the prosecutors here in Alabama, many of them would strike every person of color from the jury, and they would not do it uh, you know, subtly, they would just say, I'm getting rid of every person of color from uh, this capital jury. Uh, the judges were all elected, uh, and the district attorneys were all elected, uh, and the appellate judges were all elected. Uh, and there was no statewide funding to challenge your death sentence once you had been put on death row. So there was no uh, funding for lawyers to go ahead and challenge, were you innocent? Uh, was your lawyer ineffective? Uh, was there misconduct with the jury? Uh, so fast forward to, oh, and one other thing, the judges who were elected also had the power to override a sentence to death. I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but in Alabama at that time, if you got a life sentence from your jury, the judge could say, the elected judge could say, I disagree, I override that sentence to death. Uh, we had juries that would come back 12-0, for life, to all 12 jurors saying life, and the judge uh, would override. So fast forward to today, uh, a lot has changed in the U.S. in terms of support for the death penalty. So in the late 80s, early 90s, a lot of polls showed support around 80, 85 percent for the death penalty. That's dropped down to, depending on the poll, between 50 and 60 percent. In the last 10 years, six or seven states have done away with the death penalty. Uh, Connecticut being one, and so we've seen a lot of movement against capital punishment in this country, not so much in Alabama. Alabama is one of the leading states every year in new death sentences per capita. And so why? First of all, just like when Brian came down, there's no statewide capital public defender. So in most counties, the lawyer you get is still the lawyer who's picked by that elected judge, and there's still the quality of legal counsel still incredibly low here. I mean, you, you may have followed some of the cases uh, like in Colorado or in Bo the Boston bomber where the, tri the preparation takes months and months, and the trial itself takes months. Uh, we, Teron and I have both worked on cases down here, capital cases, where it's two days from, convict from start of the trial, jury selection, to a death sentence. Uh, so the level of representation is still incredibly low. Prosecutors still remove most people of color from capital juries here today. They now are required by the Supreme Court to say, to give a racially neutral reason, right? They have, the Supreme Court has said, now you can't just say I'm getting rid of all the people of color from this jury. You have to give a reason. But the reason sometimes, the reasons they give, we think are very pretextual. They'll say, uh, she had glasses on, uh, she she gave me a look. She gave me a look. She didn't seem like she was in favor. Uh, she had a prior conviction, and a lot of times we find that there's white people who were chosen for the jury who have those same uh, characteristics. Also, the judges are all still elected in Alabama, appellate and trial court judges. And Alabama is now the only state in the country that still has judicial over. 20% of the people on Alabama's death row got a life sentence and had it overridden uh, by elected judges. And a study we did found that the rate of override rises around election time. Uh, there is still, and now there is still no funding for people in Alabama to challenge their death sentences. We, we don't take any government money. We try and serve that role uh, at EJI. But Alabama is the only state in the country that doesn't uh, provide funding. Once sure. you're on death row, once you've had your first appeal, any funding to challenge whether your lawyer was ineffective, whether there was juror misconduct, uh, whether there was uh, violations by the prosecutor in, in not turning over evidence. Uh, there are 42 district attorneys in the state of Alabama, all elected. Anybody have a guess as to how many of those are 
people of color. Yeah, uh, okay, good. You guys are getting pessimistic. There's a lot. Uh, Michael Jackson, not the obviously not the uh, Michael Jackson, but in Selma, Alabama, in Dallas County. Uh, but the state of Alabama is a quarter uh, African American, 25 percent. Any guesses to of the 19 appellate judges in Alabama? How many of those are? These are judges that hear the appeals. How many of those are people of color? Eight. 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 Zero. Yeah, I heard a couple of people say zero. Zero of the 19 uh, are people of color. So this is, uh, this is just to point out that, that there are many reasons, systematic reasons, why uh, here in Alabama we're not seeing a movement away from uh, death sentences and capital punishment when there is that trend. Uh, in the rest of the country. Uh, so with that in mind, do you, I want to show you a quick video about a client of ours, but do you have any questions before? Just what does your case look like these days? There are uh, about 189, it changes, about 189 people on Alabama's death row. It's one of the largest what? death rows in the country. Uh, and it's uh, surprises a lot of people for a state this size. Uh, so we offer to represent anybody who's put on Alabama's death row uh, in their initial appeals, and then as they move through the process, it, it's pretty complicated, the appeal, but we, uh, we try and help them either get pro bono counsel or we represent them. So a lot of those people on death row in Alabama are on our, um, I refer to as our docket, yeah. on our, uh, and then we have children, uh, Teron's going to talk about our work with kids across the country sentenced to life without parole. So we have kids, uh, we have dozens of kids in Alabama that we represent right now, and then we have kids in many other states across the country uh, that we represent. And then the third area of our work has just kind of grown because of our profile with Brian getting some reversals early in his career on death penalty cases. People across the country, but especially in Alabama, heard about us and they now write to us and call. We get hundreds of letters and calls a week asking for assistance. Uh, and so this, this one part of our docket, we just try and help as many people as we can. There's so many people who need our help and deserve our help who we do not have the resources to help. Um, but we try and be strategic about it. Uh, and we can talk more about that maybe on the tour. Okay. So it's a little hard to give an exact kind of caseload. It, it, it varies. So funding, we, we are funded by a combination of foundations and just individual support. Uh, we've been pretty lucky. I don't know if you've heard of Brian's book. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So I'm telling you, you could have uh, just told me that. I was uh, the last 10 minutes. But uh, that's allowed us to take in a lot more individual donations, which if any of you have worked with foundations, if you can get rid of kind of the red tape of all the reporting and stuff, it, it just frees you up to do, uh, to do a lot more. In terms of criminal justice reform, uh, we can we'll hopefully talk more about that uh, later. It has not come to Alabama. There are some other states, and states that might surprise you, Texas, Georgia, that have done some positive things, uh, which we can talk about, but Alabama, their answer so far to Prison overcrowding and mass incarceration has been to try to build more prisons. Yeah. Yes. How many lawyers do you have in here? Oh, we have about forty people, but what do you think? Twenty lawyers? About half the staff. Yeah. About twenty lawyers. Yeah. What would you say has been your like? Um, if I could use the word reception in Alabama and locally to doing this work. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's I think it's changed a lot since Brian came down. I think when Brian first came down in the 1980s, there was a lot of hostility to this kind of work. Uh, there still is. We still get threats and, and, and things from time to time. Uh, but I, I haven't felt that personally. There's obviously a lot of people who don't agree with the work, but I'm pretty open about telling other people what I do and what I work on. I haven't really uh, <coughs> had a problem doing that. I don't know if you have a different experience in terms of doing this work. Um, no, but I, I think I've had some contentious conversations 
Uh, I don't know if you all noticed when you came into the building, we have a marker, a public marker right in front of the building that talks about the street and this space. And uh, um, I think it's a pretty interesting like litmus test in terms of like what the environment is now. Some people just completely walk past it. Some people walk up to it, they stop, they read, and it seems like they're digesting the information. They seem curious, interested, they might turn to the front of the building and look at what we're projecting. Then there's other people that walk up to it, they stop, they read, and then you'll hear them like suck their teeth or smack their lips afterwards. I've seen someone spit on the marker before. No. Oh. And so um, the point I was making is like those kind of divergent uh, interactions to that topic is I think a really good uh, indication of kind of how at least my experience has been in the work. We were shown a network TV video about Anthony Ray Hinton, a man who had been in prison for 30 years on death row, whom EJI was able to save just last year. I'll show a bit of that video. For 30 years, Anthony Ray Hinton was a dead man walking. <laughs> Thank you, Tebo. Thank you, Lord. Prosecution seen them to take my life from me. 58 years old, Hinton lived more than half his life inside a cage, Holman Correctional Facility in Southern Alabama. Today, he's seeing and experiencing things for the first time in decades. Oh my goodness. So, he is welcomed home, a party in his honor, hosted by the Equal Justice Initiative. Then to our utter surprise, Anthony Ray Hinton, walked up on the stage. Hinton now works for the EJI, travels around the country and tells of his experience. So we were very pleased that EJI gave us permission to use a few minutes of his talk. And he looked at me and he said, do you want to know why you're being arrested? I said, yes, sir. He said, we're arresting you for first-degree robbery, first-degree kidnap, and first-degree attempted murder. I said, oh, you got the wrong person. He continued to look at me and he said, I don't care whether you did it or not, but I promise you, you will be convicted of it. I said, for something that I didn't do. And he said, you must be harder here. I told you I don't care whether you did it or not, but I'm going to make sure that you are convicted of it. And with that, we proceeded to go to the jail. And before we got to the jail, he said, there's five things that is going on to convict you. Would you like to know what they are? And I said, yes. He said, number one, you're black. Number two, a white man is going to say you shot him. Whether you shot him or not, I really don't care. He said, number three, you're going to have a white prosecutor. Number four, you're going to have a white judge. Number five, by all accounts, you're going to have an all-white jury. And he said, do you know what that spell? I said, no. He said, conviction, 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 conviction. The victim who had been shot died, and so the charge against Hinton was changed to murder. He was convicted even though he had evidence that he was in a factory the night of the crime. Hinton was in death row for 30 years until the EJI was able to convince the U.S. Supreme Court that they should throw out the case against him. In this section, Hinton talks about meeting EJI attorney Brian Stevenson. And as I got closer to my cell, a guard was watching TV, and I stopped. And I asked this guard, I said, what are you watching? 
He said, I'm watching the lawyer out of Montgomery talk about the death penalty. His name is Brian Stevenson. <clears throat> and I said, oh, that's the man. I said, you mind if I stand here and watch for a moment? He said, sure. And Brian Stevenson was talking about why this country do not need a death penalty. And as I listened to Mr. Stevenson, I knew this was the man that I needed to represent me. And I knew I had to write him. So that night I went in my cell and I wrote him a letter. I remember in the letter I told him that I was innocent and I needed someone to believe in my innocence. I told him in that letter that I need him to read my transcript and if he can find one thing that point to my guilt, then disregard that letter. Do the only more worry about coming. I will take the faith. Whatever Alabama is willing to do would be okay. Approximately three months later, I get a reply from Mr. Stevenson telling me that he would read my transcript. Four months later, I received a letter saying that he had requested a visit and what day he would be this evening. The day that Mr. Stevenson came to see me, I shook his hand and at that moment, to this day I cannot explain it, but the moment I shook his hand, I knew that God had sent me his best. It was an incredible talk which included moments of tears, but also hilarity, as when he described his first hour out of prison when he thought there was a white woman in the car taking him home. It was his first experience with a GPS. If you ever get a chance to hear Hinton talk, absolutely do it. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle.